It's a great pleasure for me and a great honor to be invited to speak in this exciting symposium. I come from the International Agency for Research on Cancer, shortly IARC, and we are very interested to understand what are the causes of uh, different types of uh, cancers in different countries in the world. On this uh, first slide here, I would like to <clears throat> illustrate the fact that for many cancers, we know some of the causes, like one that is obvious is smoking or passive smoking. You have weight control, you have diet, alcohol intake, sun exposure, and so on. But what you can see on this graph here on the right side, for the different types of cancer, sometimes the causes are very well known, like uh, viral infection for cervix uteri. But uh, for other cancer, like breast cancer or colorectal cancer, we know much less about uh, the causes and we need to know more in order to prevent them. What is uh, very important in uh, all epidemiological studies is uh, to be able to accurately say exposures to potential uh, risk factors. And uh, most often these uh, measurements are done on a single type of exposure, but uh, with the, this new concept of the exposome that uh, was initially proposed by uh, Chris White, who was our former director at IARC, uh, uh, it's, it has become possible to measure different type of exposure at the same time. So the exposome has been defined as the totality of environmental exposures received by an individual during life. Uh, and on this graph, you see that there are different types of exposure that can be uh, general external exposure at the population level, that uh, social capital, education, and so on. There can be specific external exposure like uh, smoking or, or diet, and there can also be internal exposure related to metabolism. And there was this important statement by, made by uh, Chris Wilde that we have uh, a desperate need to develop methods with the same precision for an individual environment exposure as we have for the genome. So in this slide, I want to illustrate uh, the growth of interest for the exposome. It starts with 2005, which was the initial uh, seminal paper by, by Chris Wilde. And this paper has kept unnoticed for a number of years, but in 2010, Steve Rappaport and Martin Smith published a short paper in Science, emphasizing the potential importance of this new concept of the exposome. And this was followed by funding of some important a research project by the European Commission, like Exposomics, in which we did participate, or ELIX. And also in uh, the US, uh, the establishment of the Exposome Research Center, Hercules, uh, that also contributed to the development of the discipline. More recently, and Professor Peters also mentioned that, uh, European Commission raised a call for uh, more research on the exposome and initiated this European Human Exposome Network with nine projects funded for a total value of 100 million euros. Measuring the exposome is just uh, challenging. The exposome can be measured externally with different uh, sensors or questionnaires, and it can also be measured internally with uh, human biospecimens like blood or, or urine. We have today some uh, very, uh, modern equipment like mass spectrometers that allows to collect uh, much information from uh, these samples uh, stored in biobanks. And you see that the, it can be captured with different omic dimension from the epigenome down to the metabolome to capture this information on the environmental influence. So today it's difficult to dissociate research on the exposome from all these omic technologies. So in this picture, uh, this is a picture that we published with uh, Steve uh, Rappaport a few years ago, and it illustrates uh, the internal exposome. So you see on this representation, uh, quite large number of different uh, metabolites or chemicals that can be measured in, in blood. And so what I want to emphasize here is the different colors we have here. If you have look at the gray uh, symbols, they correspond to endogenous uh, metabolites and together they define 
define what can be called a metabotype for metabolic phenotype. We also say metabolic profiles. And on the other side, you have these colored chemicals that are derived from food, from drugs, and from pollutants. And they can also be measured in blood samples, and we can learn much about exposures looking at that. Metabolomics is an approach that allows to measure the exposome. And so we start with uh, this, uh, this part of the graph. And uh, you see, this is the fraction that we can effectively measure of the internal exposome uh, with our instrument. Uh, these uh, measurements can be linked to cancer outcome in epidemiological study in what is called exposome-wide association study, so it was. So we can look for all the chemicals or metabolites that are significantly associated with a cancer outcome. If we look at the endogenous metabolite in gray here, we can relay the metabotype with the risk of cancer to learn more about mechanisms leading to cancer. Now we can also look at the association between the endogenous metabolite and exposures. And so we can learn more about the determinant of the concentration of these endogenous metabolites. But we can also look at all these exogenous compounds derived from the diet, from drugs, and so on, and to learn directly or indirectly about uh, exposures. And so we can use this exposome-wide association study to discover new biomarkers of exposure. We can also relate these markers of exposure with cancer outcome to learn more about lifestyle factors associated with cancer. So I start with the metabotypes and cancer risk. Much of the work that I will be presenting has been obtained in the European Prospective Investigation on Cancer and Nutrition Study, shortly called EPIC. EPIC, as uh, was mentioned earlier, is uh, one of the very large uh, cohort studies that was established in the 90s in Europe. It involves uh, about half a million participants in 10 different European countries. The interest to have recruited all these subjects through Europe is that people living in different European countries have different lifestyle habits, uh, they have different diet, uh, and in this cohort uh, very detailed information on uh, dietary exposure in particular were collected with food frequency questionnaires that were specific to the different countries and fully validated uh, blood samples were also uh, collected and we have at IAC a, a biobank with all these uh, EPIC samples. About uh, three, and, three and a half million blood samples were collected and stored in liquid nitrogen. I also mentioned the EPIC calibration study with uh, about 36,000 uh, uh, participants and because we have here even more detailed uh, dietary uh, data, these 24-hour dietary recalls, and we also have a, a few ur uh, urine samples, and that I, I present this because I will uh, show some results on that as well. So we used first uh, targeted metabolomics using similar methods as the one that were shown by uh, Anna Flogel earlier. In this particular study, this was a study conducted by uh, Mathilde Is and uh, Sabina Rinaldi uh, in our uh, Ataya. Uh, using uh, the biocreators kit, where uh, the, we measured 127 different metabolites uh, in uh, this number of uh, breast cancer cases and uh, controls. And uh, after correction for multiple testing, you see in this particular volcano plot, uh, you see the metabolites that were found associated to the risk. Uh, so you have here acyl carnitine uh, positively associated to the risk of breast cancer and some other compounds, many phosphatidylcholines and uh, some amino acids that were inversely associated with the risk. Uh, and these uh, are interesting data that suggest some potential mechanism, like if I just take the example of acyl carnitine, Acyl carnitine has been associated with uh, insulin resistance in previous study and uh, was found to be also increased in pre-diabetic women. Arginine has been related to uh, immunity in uh, different experimental methods. We have collected uh, 
quite a lot of uh, similar data on different cancer type in a peak. Uh, and so we run a similar uh, analysis on a, a total of uh, 16,000 samples for these different cancer type in collaboration with different colleagues at IAC uh, or with uh, Ruth Travis and Tim Key at the University of Oxford. Uh, and uh, much of this work has already been published, and, but I would like to illustrate uh, just some differences that we can find between uh, different cancer types. This is an illustration that was uh, lent by Vivian Vialon, who is a biostatistician. And what you can see here that there are some major differences between uh, different cancer types. You see uh, breast cancer, we find acetylcarnitine here, but uh, you, if you compare with other cancer like liver cancer in particular, liver cancer, you see that there are many metabolites that are uh, positively or inversely related to, to, to the risk, maybe because liver is a very active metabolism tissue. You see that uh, there are also some metabolites that are shared uh, between different cancer types when these analyses, statistical analyses, are conducted on all sites together. This is still an ongoing work that will be published soon by Vivian Vialo and colleagues. Another uh, illustration that I would like to show with uh, what we can do in uh, EPIC with these targeted metabolomic analysis, we can link uh, uh, metabotypes to exposure. And in particular, in this work that was conducted by Rodwell and uh, collaborators and Mark Ginter also at IAC, we looked at the association between metabotypes or so metabolic profile and the WCRF score. This score captures much of uh, lifestyle with diet, physical exercise, and so on. And it's possible to identify metabolic uh, score based on the measurement of uh, these metabolites and also fatty acids in blood in EPIC. And when these metabolic score were related to the risk of uh, developing colorectal cancer in a case control study nested in EPIC, it was possible to find, as was expected, an inverse association between the score and the risk of uh, developing cancer. But what is remarkable is when you look at this uh, signature, metabolic signature that we have here, the metabolic score is even a better predictor of colorectal cancer than the WCRF score itself. Now I'll switch to untargeted metabolomics. We have been very active at IAC to develop untargeted metabolomic application in cohort studies and in particular in EPIC. So you see a typical chromatogram here and it's not uh, 100 or uh, 200 metabolites that are measured, but several thousands of metabolites that can be measured in a single run. What we have in a major difference is that all the signals that are detected here are a priori unknown. And so when we run this metabolomic analysis, we first acquire the data. We then analyze the data to find all the signals that are associated to a particular outcome or intermediate endpoint. And then finally, we identify metabolites based on different uh, spectral uh, characteristics. This is an example of an application in a peak of untargeted metabolomic and hepatocellular carcinoma risk. And uh, this was a relatively small study with about 130 cases and as many controls. Uh, so plasma samples were uh, analyzed uh, with this approach. And altogether, we measured nearly 10,000 mass spectrometry features. And uh, we found uh, 90 discriminant metabolites uh, between cases and control. And we were able to annotate 46 of these metabolites. And so you see the top 16 of these metabolites that are shown here. Some were inversely associated to the risk and some were positively associated to the risk. What uh, is interesting here is that we recognize after annotation, we recognize some vitamin or vitamin metabolites. Uh, we found some uh, amino acids, uh, we found some bile acid, but the difference between targeted metabolomics is that often you can find some unexpected finding, like for example, this methyl guanine here that is positively associated uh, to the risk, uh, which uh, is a metabolite related to uh, DNA uh, methylation. I will uh, show you another example here. This is in the TBC cohort. It's also on uh, uh, liver cancer. And uh, 
the, the, the reason why I show also this research is first that it was interesting to see that even with untargeted metabolomics, we were able to replicate many of the findings uh, that uh, we found in the previous study. Like, for example, this uh, positive association of tyrosine and, uh, and this uh, biliary acid with, with the risk. What we also did uh, in this particular study, we were interested to understand uh, why or how to explain uh, the protective effect or the reduced risk of uh, liver uh, cancer in uh, coffee consumers. So we looked at all the signals uh, that were associated with coffee intake uh, and then looked at between these signals that were associated with coffee intake, we look at the overlap with uh, liver disease mortality or liver cancer. And this is illustrated here. We find trigonaline, a marker for coffee intake, as expectedly it was uh, inversely associated with the risk. But we found also other signals uh, and that associated both to coffee and to liver cancer. And these results in particular suggested the role of uh, gut microbial dysbiosis, uh, uh, mainly explained by uh, these different bile acids and uh, tyrosine amino acids. I come to the second part about uh, export type and these exogenous metabolites and how they can be related to cancer risk. So I brought this graph, what we can call a diet-wide association study. So I borrowed this illustration from a paper by my colleague Mark Günther. In this example, what they did, they used the food frequency questionnaire and to see to how these different dietary variables were related to the risk of developing endometrial cancer. And so they found that uh, there was uh, quite a, a, a number of these dietary variables that were associated to the risk. But uh, what uh, we had in mind is uh, to what extent could we do this with this dietary compound that we can measure in blood and how can they be related to the risk of cancer. So we developed a database uh, called Exposome Explorer that captured this information on dietary biomarkers. What are all the dietary biomarkers that have been described in the literature? So you see the number here, uh, 480 different dietary biomarkers, uh, and uh, you have rich information on these dietary biomarkers in uh, this uh, database, like concentration values in different populations, uh, reproducibility values, and so on. Once you have this list of uh, markers of potential interest, uh, we're interested to see to what extent these markers can be measured in uh, the biospecimens that are stored in our biobank. Uh, and so we used a two cross-sectional study in a study in a peak uh, with blood samples, applied untargeted metabolomics and used a suspect screening approach to see to what extent these uh, dietary biomarkers we have in Exposome Explorer can be detected in blood samples. So the results are shown on this uh, figure. And you see the color are the same as on the previous plot that I've shown with pink color corresponding to compounds derived from foods. And uh, the size of the symbols are proportional to the frequency of detection. So you see that we were able to annotate quite large number of compound different compound derived from food, including some food additives like uh, saccharin or K, which are not necessarily easy to measure with uh, questionnaires. We were able also to detect some, uh, some drugs and some uh, contaminants. Um, so this exposome-wide association study can also be used to identify novel dietary biomarkers. Um, and uh, I'll show just uh, one example here about uh, processed meat product. And this graph, uh, uh, we compare different types of processed meat uh, with uh, non-processed meat. And in red, here we indicate all the signals we were able to uh, detect that were increased in uh, a processed meat product. And so in particular, we have uh, signals that are characteristic for smoked meat. And we were able to identify these markers increased in smoked meat, and they all are serangol derivatives as shown here. Um, we looked at the metabolites of these uh, serangol uh, uh, compounds, and uh, we were able to identify serangol sulfate and a number of all other sulfate esters in an intervention study, and these um, uh, metabolites were all increased specifically in uh, bacon and hot dogs that were smoked in comparison to non-smoked uh, 
processed meat product or non-processed meat product. I come back here to a peak and we had this set of urine samples, as I mentioned, and we could validate these metabolites in a peak, showing that the same compound were also increased in consumers of smoked meat products. So now if I come back to association with, with cancer. The beauty of these uh, metabolomic studies and in particular untargeted metabolomic studies is that we have very rich data set that can be further mined when we have specific hypotheses. And I just uh, show examples here of some exogenous compounds that are considered as a marker for fish intake like TMAO, free methylistidine for chicken intake. Uh, trigonelline I mentioned already as marker for coffee intake and hydroxycotinine for smoking. And so this, in this particular publication, including some of our worst publication, the authors went back to their metabolomic data and mined this metabolomic data for association with these uh, specific metabolites. So having this metabolomic data set, we can raise all sorts of uh, questions uh, later on. I will finish my presentation just uh, saying a few words about the microbiome exposome. This is a topic of great interest for us because uh, we would like to understand what is the role of the microbiota in the risk of developing some cancer like uh, colorectal cancer in particular. So we made a, an inventory of all the microbiome metabolites uh, from the scientific literature that we could consider as of microbiota origin. And we use three types of evidence. Either they can be produced in in vitro experiment by the gut microbiota, or in animal studies or in human studies, uh, their levels in blood uh, can be reduced by antibiotic treatment, and, and they can also be lower in germ-free animals. So we collected all this uh, information in the Exposome Explorer database. This data will soon be uh, publicly available. And so you can see that we can sort these metabolites according to the level of evidence we uh, have on their microbiome origin and for some compound about about 40 different of these uh, metabolites, we have uh, strong evidence with the three types of proofs and that are documented. So these are metabolites that are familiar to some of you, I'm sure, like uh, butyric acid or propionic acids. And, and so we can sort uh, these and you see that they belong to different class and we have a total of 450 uh, microbiome metabolites. And then we can use similar approach as suspect screening to develop assays to measure them with untargeted metabolomics or with targeted assays. And, we have information also on the precursors of these uh, gut microbiome metabolites. And if you take an example like uh, propionic acid, you see the long list of uh, different uh, precursors, sugars, amino acids, and so on. So this is uh, my conclusion. Um, with the internal exposome, we have a very rich uh, resource for epidemiologists to understand mechanism uh, leading to disease and in particular cancer. We have also very rich information about exposures, uh, as I've shown in, 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 in the second part of my presentation, and potentially on the microbiota. Now, these resources are really uh, underexploited today, and there is much more information that we could use from these precious samples. We have our data banks. But how far we can go with metabolomics to exploit this resource will uh, depend on our capacity also to annotate this uh, exposome in uh, our biospecimens. And this is still a tedious procedure. We actively work uh, on it uh, at IAC, as in many other laboratories. Another key question will be to be able to share uh, uh, data between lab and this will require some more standardization of the method which is that we are not yet there with untargeted metabolomics but we are making progress. Uh, this will allow more data sharing or more uh, comparison of data that are obtained in different cohorts and eventually on different platforms. Uh, and lastly, what is important, and I've tried to illustrate this uh, with the Exposome Explorer database, is that we also need knowledge database to be able to interpret uh, the different findings we get. What does it mean if a metabolite or particular metabolite increase or, or, or decrease? Um, 
And this is uh, so my final slide. And I would like to acknowledge all the collaborators uh, that uh, contributed to the data I've shown in, in this presentation. And there can be uh, a PhD student, a postdoctoral researcher, many technicians also are working in our lab to analyze uh, thousands or tens of thousands samples, uh, data manager working on development of Exposome Explorer. And all uh, my colleagues who are epidemiologists uh, or biostatistician at IARC and uh, who play a key role in the analysis of all these metabolomic data, the EPIC PIs, and also other colleagues in uh, other institutions who, with whom we are actively collaborating. And I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, 